we're going to keep going with this show. This is going to be a packed, packed fun show. So <laughs> this show is going to be about just some great memories that mm-hmm. we're going to share for our audience. Um, and the memory is going to be around advertising. <laughs> Not as romanticized as Don Draper. So um, Alexander and I, um, although he's a new guest, we worked at the same company at different times. So a lot of this show is going to be a nod to, uh, to the great teams at JWT and WPP and everything that's going on there. I was sitting on floor four. What floor were you on? I was on the second floor looking out awesome. the window at the street corner. I love it. Uh, I was fourth floor looking at the window. I think I looked at the, the building right in front of us. So I wasn't looking at Lexington. I was looking at what 45th or 46th or whatever mm-hmm. that was. Yeah. Um, so many funny stories. So this is going to be a, maybe a niche podcast, but we'll get to some bigger things. But mm-hmm. I'm at I'm at my desk and Sir Martin is doing a walkthrough of the office. <laughs> and he has like his minions. I jump up, run, Mr. Martin. My name is Darren and I work here and I want to just thank you. He looked at me welcoming and Mm -hmm. grateful and authentic Mm -hmm. his crew was like what the fuck is this guy doing here (laughs) he had like six people (laughs) right now like nice to meet you oh Mm -hmm. my god so many funny stories Uh, give me some stories that you remember of of that 466 lexington 466 wow well um i mean uh it had a great location you know in the center right in the center of manhattan a block or two away from grand central you had that 99 cent pizza right there mm. across the street. So good. <laughs> on, on Lexington Fridays, Avenue. Fridays, I'd be crushing 99 cent pizza. Fridays, yep. Oh, yeah. Um, I almost choked to death at the 99 cent pizza one time. I was out there just having a slice with my boss, and I almost choked, but luckily I survived. And now I can, you know, tell you the story on this podcast. Yeah, that, that building just has a lot of good memories, a lot mm. of storied history. I, I also remember going to visit my old teammates and I went to my desk. So what happened at, at JWT and WPP, they have like eight floors in this massive building and you can get your teams can get moved to different floors. So we were on one floor, then we moved to a different floor, then we moved to a different spot of the floor. So I went when I went back to visit after I left, mm-hmm. I went to the desk that I used to sit at <laughs> and I wanted to meet the person who sits at my desk. So I go up to the person. I said, I used to sit here. This is a lucky desk. There are lots of great things. And, and? the buildup is he's like, who the fuck are you? Why are you going to my desk? It was like the worst. Like, All right. Oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, I want to do that. like, I wanted it to be like, ah, you know who used to sit here? Darren used to sit here. And this guy's like, who are you? I'm like, All right, I'm not there yet. Maybe one day I got to keep working at it. How many floors have you worked on? Or is it just a second? So, yeah, I just sat on the second floor. At the time I was there, uh, we were on floors two, three, and four. um, Because, yes, the, you know, the fortunes of the company have ebbed and flowed over the years. Uh, I mean, I remember the last time I was in that office, which was March 13th, 2020. Like, uh, you know, that's right when we were about to hit the, the wave was cresting of COVID, which I understand was, you know, in a way the genesis of you creating the show so (laughs) that's kind of another connection point bringing us here today yeah and i'm gonna share one more memory and -hmm. then i want to keep learning about you the other memory what i loved about jwt is they would host when i was there they would print out on paper and post creative briefs Mm -hmm. and i just enjoyed just walking up and just reading the briefs and just Mm -hmm. how they positioned the work and how they were thoughtful about what the goal of and the objectives, the watch outs. And I think I learned just so much just walking around and just observing and, and just using curiosity just to like soak it all up, you know, working out with like the, the, you know, still and at the time the DOP agency and seeing the work. And floor number two when I was there was the hotshot floor. I think Ty Montague and and the whole crew used to sit on too. And it was like, wow, if you're going on too, you, 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 you needed a reason to walk down to, I mean, it was an open floor plan, but it was a lot of, mm-hmm. oh man, that was some great stuff. So now what I never met, I've met planners. I met mm-hmm. creatives. I met new biz, but I've never met the data team. So to me, this is a treat. This is a wow. treat. Um, 
because I think the data, data driven data, everything data is so important. You know, what's it like to be a data person in a creative agency, or is it now you're the norm and they're the outlier? <laughs> well, gosh, gee, is this just the pressure, the weight of history <laughs> of the expectations of, you know, leading a data team at, at now Wonderman Thompson, formerly J. Walter Thompson. I mean, you know, that's, uh, it is kind of a tough question just because the world of marketing has changed so much in the past few years. You know, the way our data function has evolved, we still help with communications and, you know, those fond memories you have of like being curious and just trying to tie like a question to sort of behavioral science to mm -hmm. analytics and data science that's still very much part of it but you know we help clients with like systems and ecosystems now in terms of like cloud migration uh, automation you know just helping them get more efficient more agile with their their marketing and really like you know wherever we can we use we want to go from data and analytics like being a tactic that helps implement the strategy to helping it be an input, you know, upstream to define the strategy. So that's, you know, that's a big challenge uh, to help our clients through, but it's an exciting one. Meaningful. There's a lot that you're saying there that I'm just kind of like thinking about in the sense that the data part drives a lot of decisions. We know that that's not new, but at the end of the day, so many decisions are still made on gut feel. Are you still seeing that in the ad world where <laughs> You have the data to support the color is yellow and they're like, we're going to go with blue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. You mean human behavior, uh, like instinct. Yeah. I mean, that well, the is... data says yellow, we're going to go blue. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, that's where data storytelling comes in, which is, um, you know, used that term is thrown around so frequently. It almost uh, it yeah. kind of like loses resonance, but it's really around just like, making it intuitive for people, you know, and yep. that's where you have to really tie into just like, you know, the sequence and the structure yes. of what you're trying to communicate as well as mental models. Uh, you know, you really give people need to give people a mental model, of how they can think about the very complex piece of information you're trying to abstract mm -hmm. for them. So pre COVID in the ad world, talking with the digital, the digital Don Draper. <laughs> Wait, is that, that me or are you yeah, referring to someone That's you. Else? I mean, if you think about, if you think about oh, Mad Men, what's the, what's the role they didn't have is your role in the TV show. Like they've had the creative, they have the new business guy, they had the finance guy, but they didn't have the data. Um, and, but, but without the trigger warnings of just like alcoholism and sexist behavior, right? I just want right. to go on the record. We're not going to talk about the JWT bar and all this, what was it? The Stoli or Smirnoff? I forget who the, the, the client was, but, um, we just had so much fun. Now the question is you're in the, you're in the data side. You're not intimidated by technology. You're not intimidated by broadcasting now doing unveils now doing things in this environment it seems like you're living your your best self in this weird environment does it make you kind of think about in the ad world specific to the ad world when you'd have to do the big launch you'd have the customer come in for four hours you'd have uh, two hours of meet this person then let's have a lunch and then let's have two hours and now you can just share files like what have you seen in in the last 18 months that is delightful right mm -hmm but not surprising for you, right? So this is this is a weird question, right? You're not surprised about these tools because of who you are, but like how you've how have you been delighted about how JWT Wonderman now is like embrace them? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're referring to a couple of things. Certainly yeah. the, the virtual workforce that we all have become a part of whether we wanted to or not in the yep. past year. I mean, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of both good and bad from that that we can understand. Uh, you know, looking back in reflection on some of, you know, the good side, I can honestly say that I don't miss commuting. Uh, it's nice to have a little bit of extra time to just, you know, spend with my wife and kids, go for walks morning and night, you know, exercise, that kind of thing. I think in some ways from a talent uh, perspective, it, it actually has been quite good because we're able to just staff teams kind of remotely staff them virtually, which has allowed to, you know, access to new talent that we might not have had if everything was local. You know, those are kind of like the silver linings we're taking Absolutely. out of this. Of course, there's the, you know, there's all the the bad stuff that, or the challenges that people have yeah. documented extensively, you know, like 
longer work days, sense of mental exhaustion, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Real um, thing. And just sort of the loss of being able to, you know, brainstorm and workshop things is tough. But I mean, new technologies like Miro and Mural and, you know, even things like Teams and Slack have, uh, you know, really know. improved a lot in the last year. And it's remarkable the adaptations that have taken place. Yeah, I, I, there's so much you said there that I want to just go through, right? Um, in certain industries, yours, I think, is one of them, my belief. There's something mm-hmm. magical that does happen with alcohol. Like going after a <laughs> brainstorming session and having a cocktail with a bunch mm-hmm. of creatives is mm-hmm. incredible. Like just to be around creatives, like a digital data person with a creative person, I think that is the number one match, right? I mean, just because mm-hmm. they are so creative in pictures and we are creative in, in numbers, words, and and other type of science. It's it's mm-hmm. a great match. The other thing, so you're right, it's the um workshopping mm-hmm. is tough. I hunt I I'm a huge fan of a mirror board. I think a mirror board and Zoom is the right mix, right? Because you can move things around. It's the right mix. But you also bring up another point after 50 minutes, it's almost impossible to stay focused on a mirror board. Mm-hmm. But yeah, a workshop, I don't know if you found the same thing, but what is like when you're in these workshops, how long do you think people can really stay focused and mm-hmm. energized and engaged? What have you seen time-wise? Yeah, like like a, a virtual workshop. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that is tough. I think kind of like 90 minutes to two hours is, mm-hmm. you know, the max. Um, right. And even even to get it that long, you have to really schedule it well with a lot of just a lot of activities like, okay, now we're going to have a discussion. Now we're going to ask people to come up with a few things on their own and share out with the yep. group. Um, it just needs to be really carefully staged because otherwise, you know, people's, it's just difficult to hold people's attention uh, yep. without being in the same room as them. And that workshop used to be a half day offsite. So oh, even yeah. at a half day, we couldn't get it in. So these are huge challenges, but I, I do agree with the next thing you said, I'm mm-hmm. living my best self in this weird world. So mm-hmm. if that means it's a two hour workshop and I don't have to commute, if it's a two hour workshop and I can go to the gym or if I can be with my family or I can meditate mm-hmm. or I can do some reflection, I'll take the two hours because I think everyone in that room wants the two hours. So there's not one person who I've met that was like, gosh, I, I miss. And I'm speaking, most of people <laughs> are, my guests are adults. So I guess the people coming out of school that want to get that, I want to work in an office experience. They're not mm-hmm. people on my show, but the adults who are like, yeah, I think it could be more efficient. So it's great to hear that you found this balance of, mm-hmm. of health because I've talked about this before. And I'm doing too much talking. I'm so excited. To this. But I've talked about this before because I'm giving myself more time to be strategic, thinking and reflecting. My execution is just spot on. And what are you seeing on your side? Your strategic mm-hmm. thinking, reflective thinking, and then the execution. How are you seeing that change? Wow, I, I envy you uh, that your execution <laughs> is getting better and better. better. It's not saying it's perfect, few... <laughs> it's better. <laughs> You'll have to give me your tips. I mean, so yeah, that is, I mean, that's kind of, I would say there are a lot of challenges there just because, you know, something about, you know, being in the same place every day, yep. uh, you know, if there's things that start to weigh on you, stresses, you know, various sources of unhappiness. You know, that was one nice thing about commuting. You just have like breaks in your day and it helps you get in a different mindset. Um, I mean, you alluded to some of the uh, some of the different ways like meditation, you know, mindfulness, reflection. I think just being really good and careful with time management and, you know, not just time management, but like energy management, making sure you don't hit the wall. Uh, you don't put yourself in a vulnerable state to just start to... Mm-hmm kind of, you know, become less than your best self. Those are things you definitely have to yep. watch out for. Now, one of the things that I like about you and your background is not only you doing great stuff, but you also give back, you mentor, you advise. And I think this is a connection here of you're working with a, a startup that I think is doing some breathing. And I think mm-hmm. I <laughs> was trained that a long time ago. It's just like those deep breaths. But what has it been like for you to... St- to now not only do your day job, but what is it? What do you like about advising and, and tinkering with okay. other startups? 
Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, you're at a place that's over 300,000 employees, and now you're advising also a startup that's probably, I know, <laughs> we can agree, under 300,000 employees. Yeah. <laughs> yes, very different set of challenges there. Um, I mean, me, me personally, to just give some context into my background, uh, you know, as I've, I've kind of worked across many different disciplines of data and analytics from a little bit more like research to kind of mm -hmm. like social media campaigns, you know, you know, analytics, enablement, cloud stuff. I think the longer I've been in the industry, there's been an accumulation of more and more risk factors and news coming to life, whether it's Cambridge Analytica, whether it's hacking and data breach, whether it's, uh, you know, new pieces of, of documentary filmmaking, like the social dilemma and coded bias that are really drawing our attention to the potential risks of technology. That's really, you know, kind of created this slow burn passion in me to to use technology in ways that, you know, enhance people's lives, whether that's at, you know, macro level um, or very like one to one level. Um, yeah. So the, the startup you mentioned, Breathing AI, um, they were just in the collision conference in New York as of time of recording this. They got to one of the top three finalists. So I just have to give them a shout out They're They're doing some great work. They're getting some momentum. Um, I love, first of all, the name is insane. Breathing mm -hmm. AI. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that is. And I've spent some time on it and I, it's easy to see. And you nailed it. This is meaningful work. This is real stuff. So I'm so keep going. I'm, I'm so happy you're involved with what they're doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Let me know. We can probably get you on the beta wait list yeah. testing so you can you can check it out. But it's sort of like the apotheosis of this dream of like, how can you use machine learning to like create a positive experience that you know just makes it makes the human experience more pleasant and so the technology for breathing ai patented is um you know piece of you know software that sits on your computer uh and it uh, through machine learning it's able to detect your respiration patterns and your heart rate you know just looking at your skin and your breathing and actually personalize your screen through use of color and ambient music to just give you like these five minute breaks that hopefully you know sort of drop your heart rate a little bit stabilize your breathing and just give you like a nice meditation break in the day um so that can be used you know if you're in moments of like acute you know do you just need to relax or ideally going on a longer term basis, it becomes a program that you sort of use alongside other goals to help you um, just achieve better quality of life. What's amazing about the technology, it's it's doing good. I mean, there is some technology like that that does bad, but you're right. The fact that it can observe and take that and, and change certain things in the display is, is just brilliant, is absolutely brilliant. And I think the end of the day is Zoom fatigue Mm -hmm. is real yeah. we are spending a lot of time on the computer and i actually think the breathe one i actually like that i'm starting to look at my diagnostics in my phone that shows you your screen time so i think you're catching a good wave right because that apple is almost training you on screen time like on your <laughs> iphone so now yeah. this one is like the next level so i think that's that is great the next one i want to talk about here is your journey right because you've had an interesting journey but i mean Framing this as the advice you would give someone coming out of school, and I'm going to add another level to this. All right. Here's my dilemma I want to hit you with. There is graduating students from college. Mm -hmm. This is the advice I want to give you based on my journey, right? That's a fair question. Mm -hmm. I think because of how schooling has gone to Zoom and all this, I think people who are sophomores and juniors should just, just leave. They're not getting the true experience, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So I would probably have you up at a level and answer it any which way, mm -hmm. but you can either be talking to people who are graduating in May this weekend mm -hmm. or people that are like thinking about, am I going back to school next year just to do another Zoom? They did not sign up for sophomore, junior year for this. Mm -hmm. So I, pick it up any way you wear, but it's still advice to the mm -hmm. younger yourself. Because tell us about mm -hmm. your path, which was not typical, but if you would have left a year early, would have mattered. Maybe, maybe not. So I don't know, just in this riff, I, I just didn't mm -hmm. pick it up anywhere you want. But these are things I think about when, because oh, I'm doing here. nothing. I'm just sitting here in isolation. So I have time to think about this stuff. <laughs> 
Man, you keep asking the hard questions, Darren. You're really We're forcing just me to. I know. I know. <laughs> to I, first of all, to our audience, he's drinking coffee. He can handle this. He had two sips of coffee already. He's on it. No, but what? I mean, you have kids. I mean, just as a human level, not as a data science, mm-hmm. but when is the right time to start the mm-hmm. journey? I guess. And what advice would you give that person? I, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you're. Um... I just needed to take a second to sort of like look yeah. look from the mountaintop that's been my life to this day and figure yeah. out what, what pieces to call out for you. So I did take an unusual path, which you're referring to, like being a Japanese literature major, major in college, you know, study abroad in Japan, translating medieval Japanese poetry and a lot of other um Someone and a huge demand piece. and a, that's a huge market. I mean, that is like, I think oh, Google you're, is you're, like hiring hundreds of me, huh? <laughs> Yes. Well, that was, uh, yeah. So dating, dating myself a little bit, but you know, I did, you know, kind of go up in the nineties right. when, uh, I mean, one Nintendo was big. So that yeah. was a great source of like <laughs> just playing right. Nintendo games. Um, so yeah. right away, you know, Japanese culture assumed it was Steve. Enough. Um, and it was also a time where, you know, Japan had been like an economic superpower uh, in the recent memory at that point. So it seemed like a productive area to go in. And of course, their economy kind of like went in stasis and it hasn't achieved the same heights they once did. So the career opportunities didn't pan out. But yeah, I mean, as I look to find meaning in my own historical actions, I think there's very much sort of a thought process and a mindset I applied to you know, learning Japanese that I now apply to, to coding and the mm-hmm. discipline of analytics more broadly because there's a, a mix of, of, you know, the hard skills and the creativity uh, with the Japanese writing system. You know, it's it requires incredible memorization. You have to learn 2000 characters uh, in order to achieve fluency. So there's just a lot of the, you know, the quote unquote hard skills aspect of it. But when you get to a point where you can like watch a movie or, uh, you know, just talk to people, go traveling, that's where you, things much more emergent and you really yeah. feel like all that hard work was worth it. And I think it's very similar to, you know, for coding specifically, like, you know, you learn coding in a lot of classroom examples, but then actually working on your first project, uh, will you have a chance to build an app or build a prototype, actually do an analysis that's going to make a business impact and, you know, test and learn, carry it through to reality. That's very exciting. And that's where you can get more multidisciplinary in terms of the different people you work with, the stakeholders who really, you need to, you know, have that data storytelling to be able to think about also what your journey, I mean, you said you also went out to Japan. Oh yeah. So, I mean, and how old were you? Oh, you know, college age. That's uh, that's huge. Yeah. (laughs) I, I would be scared um, to do that. I could. I wouldn't have the guts to do that. It was certainly a big change. It was a, a new experience. I mean, sorry, I started to ramble a bit. Going back to your question, which was what advice would I give the yep. kids of today? So, I mean, we're coming up on what we hope is like a post-COVID new normal. So people may be able to go back to in-person classes. But I was something I wish I had done and I would tell to anyone else starting college, let's say in a year or two, is to think about taking a gap year. Uh, because you're just, you're going through so much stuff as you hit like 18, 19, 20, you need to, that's the time where you can just be exposed to different things and, you know, you have more room to sort of figure it out. So I think gap year is highly recommended. I mean, zooming out a little bit. Yes, I have kids ages six and nine, but, uh, it's tough to imagine what college would be like in their future in like five to 10 years, you know, you're gonna just with distance learning and, you know, certainly more like applied function on skills, I think it is going to give a to- go through a, a disruption. Uh, so at the moment, I'd say it's, it's tough to imagine them going to four years, you know, the same way I did at college, uh, but we'll have totally to see agree. how it plays out. I, I totally agree. I, I think you're, you're giving parents and you know, who are listening to the show or data community, just more ammunition. The gap year is brilliant. You know, I, I think this has been also for adults, the professional gap year. It's just been, everyone's been able to go to a different city and work. I mean, this is, um, this is like, this is my professional gap year, but you're right. And what I also heard, which I didn't have the guts to do, and I wish I did, but I didn't have the guts to do is go far away, Mm -hmm. you know, go far away, you know, experience far away, whatever that means to you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, we all have, that's why I want to keep it. 
go far away, experience those cultures. You'll meet different things. It'll put you on a path. But I thought you had a lot of guts to go far away. I don't think I can go that far. I mean, for me, my far away would be, you know, maybe New York to California. Like that's far, right? <laughs> but others, it's New York to Hawaii, New York to Paris. Doesn't matter. Just go somewhere. Be curious. I think people are just always, oh, but I can't miss my friends. I'm going to miss the college experience. And I think when you look mm -hmm. back on it, it's just like, professionally, you don't, there's meetings you'll never remember that you missed, or there are meetings <laughs> that you went to that you wish you did something else. And I just, if, if mm -hmm. this time in that gap year can get people to think mm -hmm. it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything. I mean. There's, I'll recommend a great book I read uh, early last year called How Will You Measure Your Life uh, by Clayton Christensen. Uh, most people have heard of his, one of his other books, The Innovator, Innovator's Dilemma, about how disruptive technologies lead, you know, the titans of industry to being toppled and replaced. But How Will You Measure Your Life, I think, is a great one. And also, you know, very much on the theme of self-reflection, which is important now. Yeah. No, I appreciate it a lot. I miss those days, brother. It's good to connect <laughs> with, with you, man. This is, um, this is fun. Thanks for being on the show and, and thanks for being so much, so friendly on, on LinkedIn. We have a lot of fun in our chat, so we'll, we'll keep that up. And <laughs> when oh, we're yeah, in the same yeah. cities, we'll definitely, we will be cocktailing when we're in the same cities. I can promise you that. Definitely. Um, I got my first vaccine shot today. We're, oh, congratulations. The is coming. <laughs> Thank you. My, I got, I'm two, I'm two vaccine shots. Um, Pfizer, which one did you get? Pfizer. Pfizer, great. Just, mm -hmm. just keep you on like this today. Ice and keep, <laughs> just, you, yeah. you, and it won't hurt as much tomorrow. Congratulations on that. Um, oh, thank you. I, I tell everybody when I got my second shot, my second mm -hmm. shot, I, I say I, I felt like Superman just unbuttoning the two top buttons. I wasn't ready to rip this, the, <laughs> but like, you just feel like you just, you just got something here. That's going to make you a little bit uh, stronger. So, um, now we are a community and we introduce people to each other. Is there, is there a sector you want me to introduce you to? Is there a, a person, mm -hmm. a, a skill set? who can I make a couple intros for you? Just oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've tried to listen to as many of your podcasts as possible, but I'm still only scratching the surface, yeah. uh, in terms of all the great guests, I think. Just building on that theme, uh, like with breathing.ai of things like digital wellness. Uh, okay. And if that's too niche, I think more broadly looking at kind of like responsible AI and just, uh, okay. you know, that's a growing, a growing yeah. facet of the industry. Just talking to people who are, you know, doing good work there and, and open to networking. Yeah, perfect. You know, we had a great guest, um, Shane from Calm. So I'll, I'll connect you over with Shane. He's doing some killer stuff over there. So happy to. And then as I see other things to play around with, with data, I'll, I'll loop you in on some other data stuff. Oh, awesome. Yes. Yeah. And, and thanks for having me on the show and no, having a fun. chance to talk about the memories, the digital John, Don Draper. I'll have to, <laughs> I'll have to uh, right. remember that. <laughs> Got it. All right, brother. We'll get together soon, man. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Darren. Have a yeah, good brother. one. Same. Bye. Bye.